All right, here we are, Lessons from the Kings, the Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number seven, David's Charge to Solomon. And if you're following along in your Bibles, please open them to 1 Kings chapter two. I believe that our lives are filled with defining moments, uh, many important times in each of our lives. You know, the moment we decide to become a Christian, for example, or the moment we realize that we have met the person that we want to marry, or the happy occasion when our first child is born, or the day of our retirement. You know, we, we all have milestone moments in our lives. And these defining moments are important because it's during these times that the course of our lives changes, affecting everything and many times everyone around us. I suppose this is why we have created ceremonies and we make speeches at these times, because each occasion provides us our opportunity to teach valuable lessons that may be, uh, that may be needed along the way. So in the final lesson, looking at King David uh, in this series on the Kings, um, I'd like to focus on one such defining moment that came as his own life and rule were coming to an end. And this was the moment when he gave a charge to his son Solomon, who would rule um, after he was gone. Now, although he lived uh, in a very different day and a different culture, uh, David had his share of defining moments. And I think we, we of course, we haven't had time to go over all of these in this uh, series, and I, but I'm, I'm sure that everyone is fairly familiar with David's life. Uh, when he went out to face and defeat Goliath, uh, he went from being an obscure shepherd boy to a national hero. So that was a defining moment in his life. Uh, when Samuel anointed him to become the future king, he went from a favored military leader to hunted outlaw, always in fear for his life. So he had favor with the people, favor with the king, and then all of a sudden, whoa, he was an enemy of the king and he was hiding out defining time in his life. When Saul died and he became king, he took on responsibility for the entire nation, not just a, a band of rebels that he led while he was hiding from Saul. So this time he had to step up again and, and rule as a legitimate king. Through each of these changes, God was shaping and defining David's character and spirit so that he would become a man after his own heart. David wasn't born a man after God's own heart. He was formed in that image. He was molded in that image through God's work in his life. When David was old and at the end of his reign, he handed the kingdom over to his son Solomon. Now there's a final defining moment for David and one of the first defining moments for Solomon. During this important exchange, there's a charge that David makes to Solomon which contains a pearl of wisdom that can be passed on to those who will be leaders of the church in the future from those who are leading the church now. So it's, you know, there's a parallel here. You know, to the, a past leader passing on to a future leader, uh, words of wisdom. Uh, and I believe in the church we have that similar situation that occurs in every generation where the present leadership slowly but surely uh, begins to pass on to the future leadership the responsibility for the, uh, for the congregation. So the charge to Solomon by David is contained in 1 Kings chapter 2 uh, verses 1 to 4 and I'd like to read those for you. It says, as David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong therefore and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out His promise which He spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So David had reigned for 40 tumultuous years, during which time he had secured peace for the nation and had also amassed a great fortune. Now it was time for Solomon to take over. And so at this critical moment, David provides him with a charge that we've just read. 
and he tells Solomon three things that he must do in order to succeed in the future. And our lesson uh, today is comprised of these things that David charged Solomon with. First thing he says to him is, grow up, grow up. Now in the Hebrew word, uh, or in the Hebrew language rather, the word strong meant to establish yourself, to stand on your own two feet. Show yourself a man was the Hebrew way of saying, act like an adult or, or grow up. Solomon had been groomed for the throne, but he was always in the shadow of his father. Uh, he could practice being the king, but he didn't have to really make any of the decisions and abide by any of the consequences because, well, he wasn't the king. David's first charge is to take off the, you know, the training wheels and cast off the safety net of childhood. And he says to him, you know, begin acting like an adult because now it was for real. You were really going to be the king. Now I suppose this would also be my first charge to the future leaders of the church if I were to make a charge to those individuals and their wives. The time to grow up spiritually is now, not sometime in the future when there's more time or more opportunity. Young mothers need to realize that the critical training of their children's spiritual lives happens, well, it happens right now, not when they are teenagers, because by then <clears throat> it'll be too late in many cases. Boy, if you wait till your child is a teenager to teach them about God or to teach them about spiritual things, one thing can be uh, fairly certain. Someone else has already taught them a lot of things about that before you're getting around to teaching them. No, the time to begin teaching them is when they're very young. Young men, of course, and fathers, they need to realize that Elders and deacons who are serving now <clears throat> will not serve forever. They'll need to be replaced by men who are among our number today. This building here, this congregation was established and built by people just like yourselves who decided to, to grow up spiritually and take responsibility for this church and its needs. Of course, this charge goes both ways. For example, David didn't just pretend to give Solomon the crown. He actually gave his son the nation to rule and he took himself off the throne. You know, our present leaders and teachers should actually uh, search for and encourage those who are willing and able to take the lead in ministering to this congregation. And, and I encourage them to gradually allow them to take full responsibility not just for this congregation, but for any congregation. The system is the same, the procedure is the same. The charge that I'm uh, talking about here uh, from, so, uh, from David to Solomon and from the present leaders to the future leaders of this congregation uh, is exactly the same to any congregation in, in any place. It's the, the, the essence of the charge is exactly the same. Now I say this not only for our group, but for the church in general. Congregations should be aware not only who their present leaders are, but they should be aware of who the potential leaders are of the future and begin grooming them when? Now. Not wait until it's too late. I once said some elders are getting up there in years, 70, 80 plus years. They will not be serving you know, for more decades, let's put it that way. Uh, leaders uh, need to be trained, they need to be groomed, they need to uh, mature slowly so that they can take over progressively the, the congregation from those who are uh, presently uh, in the lead. This is the wise way of transferring leadership from one generation to another. The second thing that uh, David says to Solomon is obey the Lord, verse 3. Now David, you know, he says it in a variety of ways. He says, you know, keep the charge of the Lord, walk in His ways, keep His statutes, ordinances, testimonies. But in the end, it was all the same charge. Obey the Lord in all that you say and do because without obedience to the Lord, you'll fail. It's guaranteed. It's interesting to note that Solomon lived out this very charge. He began well and he obeyed the Lord and he was blessed in every way possible. Then he fell into idolatry and his disobedience led the nation and his own household into ruin. At the end of his own life, 
he writes, and I'll uh, put that up for you, he says, the conclusion when all has been hurt is, fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. And so at the end of his own life, he writes that to obey God and His commands is all that really matters in life. And it, it is especially important uh, to those who uh, lead uh, in the church to obey God uh, in all matters or to make the best attempt at obeying God and knowing His will in all matters so critical in the success of the church, the success of the leadership. So this particular charge you know, I would especially make not just to the, the, the leaders of the church but to, the, to young people. Certainly to obey the Lord is a priority at any age but it is especially important for those who are either young in years or young in Christ. You see, it's at the beginning of something that you create habits and ways of acting that will repeat themselves through your entire lives. Learning the habit of obeying God is critical if one is to have a successful Christian life and that's at any stage of life. You know, your, your parents and your grandparents can vouch for this. If you put God first in your life, you will be blessed. If you abandon the Lord and forsake His church and disobey His word, your life will be filled with sorrow and trouble, uncertainty and, and emptiness uh, inside. Statistics show that the point where people who begin well as young Christians and then fall away is usually after they graduate from high school or for college. So this is the time when many young people are tempted to stop coming to church. Very critical moment. You know that defining moment I was talking about the, at the beginning? One of the defining moments for young people is when they graduate from high school or college uh, because uh, at that point there's a challenge uh, exerted on them, a temptation, a, 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 an influence uh, to be molded more uh, in the ways of the world than in the ways of Christ. And they have to rise to that occasion and resist the temptation to be uh, molded in the mold of the world and to remain uh, faithful to Christ, remain faithful to uh, the Lord. Along with the responsibility for being a young independent adult, comes the responsibility for maintaining your faith, for choosing to obey the Lord in all things. Your parents are less and less able to tell you to go to church or make you get involved. You know, the change for young people is that they have to decide that this is what they're going to do at that defining moment in their life. It's at this important time in life when we really find out if a young person's faith and commitment, their love for Christ is really theirs or just something they borrowed from their parents. Another aspect of that defining moment in their lives. No matter who uh, one becomes, no matter how much success or failure one experiences, remember that it would all be for nothing if you're not faithful Christian at the end of your life. You know, what, what, what will we give in exchange for our souls? You know, financial success or fame or ease or pleasure or you know, whatever, travel. Is that what we're going to exchange for our soul? How faithful a person is at the end of their life depends largely on how faithful and obedient they choose to be at the critical moments when they are young in their life and young in their faith. You can't put it off. You, know, you can't say, well, I'll start going to church later. I'll get you know, involved later. I'll become more spiritual when I'm older. Just getting older does not make you more spiritual. There's this myth, you know, as you get older, you become more spiritual. Well, you may become more knowledgeable, but you don't necessarily get more spiritual without making an effort to be more spiritual. Just growing older doesn't do that. Solomon warned that if you didn't choose to do it when you were young, you might not have the chance to do it when you were older. And that's what he's talking about in Ecclesiastes. All right, another thing that uh, David charges Solomon with, teach your children well, verse four. David tells Solomon that he is giving him this charge because God charged him with the very same charge. He now tells Solomon that he too must pass along these things to his own children if he wishes to continue God's blessings upon them. You know, uh, the promise of God to David was that if he was obedient, 
to God. God promised him that there would always be a king on the throne from his family. And now David passes along this promise, if you wish, to Solomon. But the, the requirement is, if you remain faithful to the Lord, then that promise will stay with you. But part of that will be that you'll have to teach your children the same promise. You, Solomon, will have to teach your children that if they are faithful to the Lord, he will guarantee that one of their descendants will always be on the throne, and so on and so forth. Now, um, Again, we see that Solomon in all of his wisdom did not see fit to teach his own children. And they, they fell into idolatry and they split the kingdom after uh, Solomon's uh, death. There was a civil war caused by his own child. You know, Solomon had a thousand wives and concubines. Most, most of these women were pagan. And this is how the influence of idolatry came into his house and ultimately into the nation. You know, within the next 10 years, many of our young people uh, will be married and, and starting families. And this will be the next defining moment in their lives. You know, graduation, that's one defining moment. You know, and then marriage and family and career, that's the next defining moment. And that next defining moment will be the one that most affects their lives all the way into the future. So David addresses this point in his son's life by reminding him how he was taught and how he is to teach his own children. This is a, a good lesson to encourage uh, our young single people um, who are almost at that point in their life where they're going to take a marriage partner and begin a home and a family and so on and so forth. The encouragement to decide that they should marry men and women who are faithful to Christ themselves, faithful to His word, faithful to His church. If they do, then they will be able to teach their children without conflict in the home. And if they do, they will be able to share and encourage each other's faith. And if they do, they will have a marriage that has more peace, more joy, more success. Why? because God promises this to you if you obey Him on this matter. So some people say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter who you marry, oh, but it does so much matter for many reasons, not just because of uh, you know, a person's faith, uh, their religious background, a lot of other things. But in this class, we're talking mostly about uh, religious and uh, issues of faith. It's very important that uh, young people consider faith um, as something uh, uh, to be discussed with a future uh, marriage uh, partner. You know, our, uh, our children are never too young to hear this message because as I've said to my kids, you date who you hang around with and you marry who you date. I mean, if, only, if you have 100 friends and only one of them is a Christian, uh, the odds are 99 to one that you're going to, uh, that you're going to marry someone who is not a Christian. So I would encourage young people to decide early on that they will only marry a faithful Christian because this will set the course of their friendships and this will set the course of their lives. And it, was also, it will also set the course of their children's lives and their children's children. Very, very important, the, the, the decision they make at that defining moment of their, of their growth. So after David's charge, Solomon went on to be a great king. But because he failed to listen to his father's voice, he suffered many things. He suffered depression, trouble in his family, and ultimately the destruction of the great kingdom established by his father. He did repent, of course, in the end to save his soul, but much suffering had already happened then. So if we're to gain anything from the experience of these kings, we should recognize that their lessons affect all of us. Because in you know, lessons from the kings, the lessons that come from the charge that David gives to Solomon, the lessons that come when we compare the life of David and the legacy of David and the life of Solomon and the legacy of Solomon are, are, are very, very important. So uh, in that spirit, the lessons go to different people, to the leaders, 
the lesson is be on the lookout for and cultivate tomorrow's leaders today. Because neglect to do so will create a leadership vacuum in the future, which is a dangerous thing in the church. And I, I really know of, of what I speak. I come uh, from um, a small church background, mission church background, obviously was converted in a, uh, a congrega at a congregation that had very few people, no elders, no deacons, one uh, missionary um, that was working there. And I myself have worked for many, many years with congregations in the mission field, so to speak, where uh, there was no uh, leadership, there were no elders, they were not yet, not enough mature Christians to form an eldership, no deacons. Uh, where I was the only uh, um, you know, individual uh, commended into the work. I was the only minister. Um, a very difficult uh, situation when there's no leadership. I always tell people, if you don't like the way things are running you know, with the eldership, you know, try being in a congregation that has no eldership. And I guarantee you, you'll, be, you'll come running back. Uh, very important to have uh, a strong eldership. And in our congregation, we often mention you know, that uh, we are uh, 75 years, this congregation has, uh, has uh, existed uh, and, and, and it has succeeded largely due to the fact that very early on in its existence, this congregation had elders. At first, only two or three, and then with time, as the congregation grew, uh, more elders were added. But I believe that the success that this congregation has had for the last uh, 75 years, largely due to the fact that there has been an eldership from almost the very beginning of this congregation. So to the leaders, cultivate tomorrow's leaders today. Next, to the church, to everyone, make the obeying of the Lord a priority in your life and a priority lesson that you teach your children. You know, a lot of our prayers are usually uh, what I call felt need prayers. I need stuff, whatever, you know. I need a new car, I need a new job. I need to find a way out of this. I need for you to help my mother because she's sick. I need for you to uh, get my uh, husband off of alcohol. I need, you know, I need, I need, I need. And that's fine because we're told that ask and you shall receive, right? We're told to pray and God knows what we need and so on and so forth. But sometimes, you know, the prayer has to be, Lord, uh, reveal to me what it is that I can do to be more obedient to you. Now there's a prayer that I don't know if it's often said. Or Lord, show me uh, sin in my life. Reveal to me, you know, the sin in my life, what it is. Uh, certainly we're aware of some of the sins that we are guilty of, but we're not aware of all the sins we're guilty of. And a good prayer that leads to repentance, then that leads to spiritual growth and leads to a closer relationship with God, is to ask Him, Lord, reveal to me, me. Show me who I am for real in your eyes. Help me to understand those things that I need to remove from my life and how I can be more obedient before you. This is the gateway to so many blessings and the neglect to do this um, is the path to so many sorrows. We ask ourselves many times, why is my life always ending up in the same situation? You know, I mean, it's like you know, Yogi Bear used to say, deja vu all over again. You know, why am I repeating this cycle? And, and it goes badly. It's because there's something there, there's some sin, some weakness, some, you know, uh, some immorality of some kind that we continue to fall victim to and many times not aware of it. And so the prayer for clarity, not only help me to see you more, Lord, but help me to see me more that I might begin the necessary changes. So uh, to the leadership, plan for tomorrow's leaders today. To the entire congregation, uh, ask God to help each and every one of us be more obedient to Him in every matter, large and small. And also for young people, uh, my encouragement based on this lesson, choose friends and marriage partners who can help you remain faithful to Christ 
and support your ministry in the church. Let that be the criteria for your friends. Not which ones are popular or which ones are good looking or which ones you know, have stuff, like they have a car and you don't have a car or they got sports equipment and you don't have sports equipment or they have a pool at their house and you don't have a pool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having friends who are good looking or popular or so on and so forth. But if that's the only criteria, then that's an awfully worldly criteria. One of our criteria should be, uh, help me Lord to find friends that share my faith or that I can share my faith with. No other choice will affect your life more than that choice that you choose to have as friends other Christians. And for those of you who have Christian friends, I would say make friends with those Christians that can encourage you to go beyond yourself. Because a lot of times we choose friends that share our weaknesses so that you know, we won't, you know, we can continue in our weaknesses. Nobody will call us on our weaknesses because my friend has the same weakness that I do. He swears like a sailor and I swear like a sailor so we don't call each other on that. You see what I'm saying? A better way is to find friends you know, in the Lord that can help us, that can challenge us, that we can aspire to grow to you know, their level of spirituality. A good thing. And also maybe the other way around, make friends with those who are new Christians that we can encourage and, and, and bring along and mentor. A great relationship in that way. As I said, no other choice will affect your life more than that particular choice. All right, so this is the end on the section of David. We could say so much more, but we, we wanted to take a little bit, you know, a few lessons from a variety of kings. Our next king will be one that very few people know about, but teaches a lot of lessons about trust. And that is the lessons from King Hanan. And that's the, uh, that's the lesson that we'll take on next time we meet. Thank you for your attention and we'll uh, keep going with our series next week.